Hi, I'm Talia Baroncelli, and you're watching the analysis.news. I'll shortly be joined by Paul Jay for a three part series on the war in Ukraine, the prosecution of Donald J. Trump, as well as global oligarchy and capitalism. But first, please do go to our website, theanalysis.news, and hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen. Most importantly, get on our mailing list. That way you'll be emailed every time a new episode is released. You can also go to our YouTube channel, The Analysis Hyphen News, and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell. The bell ensures that you'll be informed every time a new episode drops. See you in a bit for part one of our three part series with Paul Jay. Joining me now is Paul Jay, your favorite host at the analysis.news. It's really well, not any not anymore. <laughs> it's great to see you, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. So you've been really busy lately and we haven't seen you. What have you been up to? Um, I've been up to my eyeballs in a documentary film I'm working on called How to Stop a Nuclear War, uh, which is based on Daniel Ellsberg's book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. So I was out twice in the last few months in Berkeley, where Dan is, uh, filming um, more interviews with him. I've actually been interviewing Dan on and off for the last three years. Uh, but we're kind of getting much more into the thick of the production now. And when I came back last time, I had COVID and I was kind of out of it with that. But, uh, and, <coughs> and the cough is a residual of that. Yeah, I we can see that, unfortunately. Yeah, I apologize if I'm coughing during this interview. Um, but, uh, but the work's going very well. Uh, Dan, uh, people, a lot of people may know, is, is ill. Uh, he's 92 years old and diagnosed recently with pancreatic cancer. Uh, he sent an email or a, a kind of a message out letting all his friends and everyone know about it and it kind of went viral apparently two three million people have seen his note and he's been interviewed many times now on mainstream media and right now he's doing pretty well but uh sadly he probably won't won't be for long but he's he's still quite energetic well, in all your recent interviews with Dan, and I mean, you've known him for so many years, what has his core message been recently, especially with regards to climate change and Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Well, he's feeling uh, frustrated, I guess. Um, he was hoping all the work he had been doing would have had more effect than it's had. Um, although I think it has had more than he thinks it has. Um, but he thinks the danger of nuclear war is, is as great now as it's ever been, and perhaps even more dangerous now. Um, and obviously climate change. But one of the things he said, if people watched his interview, which I thought was you know, quite profound and, and important, was comparing the Cuban Missile Crisis to what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, the, the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, compared the American blockade of Cuba uh, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that the United States was threatened by Soviet missiles in Cuba and had a blockade against Cuba. And Russia, threatened by the expansion of NATO, and even possibly uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine uh, had a right to, you know, what they're calling the special military operation, which is, you know, they use those words because to say war opens it up to a question of whether this is a legal or unjust war, illegal war. So that they come up with this terminology of special military occupation, which is kind of nonsense. But uh, when I asked Ellsberg about comparing the Cuban Missile Crisis to Ukraine, he said, well, there is a comparison, but it's not the one Lavrov is making. Um, in fact, the uh, Soviet uh, missiles in Cuba were no additional threat to the United States, even though there were nuclear weapons in Cuba. Um, but it didn't actually alter the geopolitical equation at all because the Soviet Union already had submarines that could fire on Washington or New York. So nothing, nothing was added to the threat. 
And in fact, the blockade that Kennedy put up uh, around Cuba, uh, while it was better than an invasion, which is what the Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted, and, and it seems Bobby Kennedy wanted, uh, and Jack Kennedy and maybe Adlai Stevenson were almost the only ones that, that really didn't want the invasion and risk where that would lead. But the blockade itself was illegal. You know, to blockade a country is, a, is a, itself an act of war, an act of aggression. And Kennedy had no right to put up that blockade. Uh, so to compare uh, Cuba to Ukraine and Russia is actually not a favorable comparison for the Russians. Because Ellsberg argues uh, the Ukraine situation is very similar in that uh, even if Ukraine joined NATO, it's not an imminent threat to Russia. I mean, Estonia is already in NATO and there's no threat from Estonia to Russia. Uh, and in fact, Ukraine wasn't about to get in NATO anyway. I mean, people have heard me say this a hundred times and it's, it's easily verifiable. Both France and Germany and in all likelihood Turkey were not going to allow uh, Ukraine into NATO. And if there isn't consensus, they can't do it. So, so there just was no imminent threat. So the, the thing that the, the, the underlying comparison that uh, Ellsberg makes is that Kennedy was so uh, afraid or, uh, of domestic political forces, the Republicans uh, accusing him of being soft on communism, soft on the Soviet Union, soft on Cuba, that he had to look tough and he couldn't be humiliated by these missiles in, in Cuba because Khrushchev had promised him there wouldn't be any missiles in Cuba and Khrushchev put them in anyway. And that's a similar situation uh, to Putin, that, that, that if, if Ukraine was to be in NATO, if Ukraine was to you know, have these kinds of weapons, it would be a humil humiliation for Putin, not a real threat to Russian national security. Ukraine was not about to invade Russia. Um, but you can't underestimate underestimate these factors. You know, the, the Kennedy's fear of humiliation and Putin's similar, both dealing with domestic situations. In Putin's case, a, a rising alienation and opposition to the Russian oligarchy. And we're not the only ones that see, see pictures of these Russian oligarchs living on these enormous yachts in the Mediterranean and wherever, where much of Russia, uh, Russian people are living in poverty. Um, so, so Ellsberg, you know, condemns the Russian invasion, but, and this is the big but, um, the, the danger of nuclear war because of the Russian invasion and the danger of nuclear war because of the American role, perhaps provoking this, you know, with talk of NATO expansion, but like I say, I, I, I They'll see no evidence it was really going to happen. But since the invasion, uh, the U.S. has certainly embraced this as an opportunity to try to weaken Russia, perhaps bring Putin down, and are doing everything they can to stoke and provoke this war to go on perhaps even for years. You know, the phrase has been used over and over again. The, the Americans will fight for the U.S you know, the, the right of NATO to take in new members to the last mm. Ukrainians right. to, you know, until every Ukrainian is dead. Um, so he, he's, you know, while he condemns the invasion uh, quite unequivocally, he also condemns the role of the U.S. and NATO, uh, and particularly the, the Americans in, in, in not pushing for compromise now and continuing to flood arms into Ukraine. What do you think Ellsberg would say to the fact that, yes, of course, NATO has been expanding and has been pushing those red lines, so to speak. But what about Russia's imperial ambitions? I mean, maybe they would have gone ahead with the invasion regardless and were just, you know, using the, the sort of specter of NATO expansion as a pretext to invade Ukraine. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that question uh, because they never we never got a chance to see it. Um, you know, certainly a lot of Russians I've talked to uh, in Russia uh, do think it was a pretext. Uh, you know, the, the point is, is even if Ukraine did join NATO, how does that really change anything from Estonia? 
And in fact, what they've accomplished now is now Finland and NATO. So that now they have even more NATO border, uh, you know, Russian NATO border. So it certainly didn't minimize the threat from NATO. Um, but but I think we, to step back a bit here, uh, with, without mitigating the message that there was no imminent threat to Russia, which makes this a war of aggression. And I mean, the, what I ever think I understand about the Nuremberg decisions and international law and the UN Charter, <clears throat> the right to self-defense only kicks in if there's imminent threat. And imminent really means imminent. Like you're about to get attacked and there's no other way out of getting attacked but a preemptive defense. Short of that, it's a war of aggression, period. Right, and it has to be an imminent threat uh, spatially, so territorially, but also temporally. So in terms of it being an imminent threat right then at that very moment or in, in that time frame and not you know a few months prior. That's, that's the essence of it, imminent, exactly. immediate. In, in the moment. Yeah, that's the essence of it. And there, at the time of the Russian invasion, there was 150,000 Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. Uh, even if there were uh, Ukrainian troops uh, near the Donbass, and there's a claim, and, I mean, the numbers go all over the place. Uh, Lavrov has said 75,000, others have said 50,000. I saw the head of the Russian Communist Party said there were 150,000 or something, 100, uh, Ukrainian troops about to invade Donbass. Well, there's no evidence of any of that. The OSCE that does these reports does report on an increase of shelling, but that shelling was back and forth from the Donbass region into the Ukrainian government-controlled area and Ukrainian missiles going into the independent or autonomous-controlled regions. Some people say Russian-controlled. Uh, there's a lot of shelling going on, but there were very, very few deaths, if any. Uh, and, and the number of deaths in 2021, you know, leading up to that, uh, the 150,000 Russian troops uh, in, in the whole of the uh, region, according to the OSCE, there were 10, 10 deaths as a, as a result of the fighting uh, and maybe could be attributed to the Ukrainian side. I mean, there more people were killed in car accidents. So, so there certainly was no imminent threat uh, to uh, for Ukraine to invade Russia. I don't see evidence there was an imminent threat to Donbass. But even if there was, which again, I don't know that there was, but let's say there was, how likely it is it, uh, that they're going to do that when there's 150,000 Russian troops on their border? And if there were Ukrainian troops gathering, it's, it's probably more likely they're doing it because there's 150,000 Russian troops on their border. And even then, Donbass is, was an, uh, still part of Ukraine. It was still an internal matter of Ukraine. Uh, you know, it'd be like, you know, if Quebec was, you know, trying to declare independence from the Canadian federal government and Canadian troops were massing to go in and suppress, I don't know, the Quebec provincial police or whatever it would be. The, you know, the Americans don't have a right to come in and get involved in that. And it's not a complete stretch of the imagination either. Some crazy neocons once talked about the U.S. should intervene and support the Quebec independence movement. Anyway, but all that said, but the focus of Ellsberg is on the threat of nuclear war and the climate crisis and that that the Americans are playing a role now to provoke, stoke more than provoke, to, to sustain this war in a way that the Ukrainians don't feel any need to negotiate or and or there's some evidence that Zelensky at one point did want to negotiate. And Boris Johnson went in and, and trounced it. I think there was meetings going on in Turkey. So, you know, there's no doubt that that that, that the Americans are trying to keep this war going to weaken Russia so it cannot be a rival in Europe. And it's a on so many levels, it's it's insane. Well, you have heard uh, different Ukrainian um, higher ups in the government speaking about Crimea. I think recently some of them are saying perhaps we can negotiate 
Crimea and we, we won't need to take it back for us to have some sort of um, final victory. But then some other diplomats or officials were walking that back. So it's hard to really gauge what the flexibility is and, and you know, how die hard they are on having complete territorial integrity, how long they want to fight for. But if you look at the recent uh, Pentagon leaks that were showing U.S. and NATO military plans and assistance to the Ukrainian military, it does seem like there is a spring offensive underway. So do you think maybe that's why they haven't been investing much political capital in diplomacy? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the, first of all, I mean, it's been said over by many people, but the American military industrial complex, arms manufacturers are having, you know, this is heaven for them. Uh, you know, they're talking about how depleted American weapon stocks are now. Well, what does that mean? You got to resupply American weapon stocks. Apparently, Raytheon was saying that it's going to take them years to catch up uh, and, and, and with what's been depleted in Ukraine. So, I mean, what Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Gunham, and they love this. Uh, and so there's this great economic pressure uh, on the Biden administration. Um, th there's no doubt if th that, that a just position anyone that cares at all about peace in this world, and even more importantly, anyone that cares about actually people focusing on the climate crisis and reducing the risk of nuclear war, uh, the pressure needs to be, yes, denounce the invasion, but at this point, there has to be uh, negotiations. And everybody knows more or less what, where the, what the end game of this negotiations is. Thomas Pickering, who's a former American diplomat, he writes in foreign affairs. I mean, he laid it out, but he's not the only one. It's pretty clear. Uh, one, one way he suggests is take all the disputed territories in Lugansk and Donetsk and put them under UN supervision and then have legitimate referendums and let the people decide what status do they want. You know, they want to be a part of Russia. They want to be part of Ukraine. They want to be autonomous, independent. I, I don't think I don't think, from what I understand, there's any doubt that the people of this region has a, have a right to self-determination. Um, same thing goes with Crimea, but the only difference with Crimea is that it's it's uh, far more a little more complex, given its history of being in Russia and then being in Ukraine and back in Russia. But more important to me than these uh, border histories is there were quite a few what seems like legitimate polls taken after the referendum in 2014. And the majority of people of Crimea apparently do support uh, Crimea joining Russia. But let, let that be certified again. If that's the case, then fine. Um, people have a right to self-determination, but uh, countries have a right to defend their sovereignty. And sometimes these are contradictory principles, like take Taiwan. Does Taiwan have a right to self-determination? I think so. You know, I, I won't, I'm not a lawyer, but you, you look, you go into all the various ingredients of what would give a, a, a province of China, like Quebec's a province of Canada, what would give Taiwan, you know, the right to self-determination? Uh, from what I know, I think it meets those criteria. But China has a right to defend its sovereignty, and that includes Taiwan. The same way Canada, even if Quebec has a right to self-determination, it doesn't mean Canada doesn't have a right to defend the sovereignty, including Quebec. For example, if the U.S. were to try to intervene to facilitate Quebec's independence, that would be illegal under international law. It would be a crime of aggression. It doesn't matter whether there's a right to self-determination. So they're, they're complicated, sometimes contradictory principles. But the underlying fundamental principle is the well-being of the people involved, peace as a primary principle, and working people of each countries should not slaughter each other for the sake of the oligarchs of their countries. And the same thing goes for Ukraine. You know, you know, I've been saying uh, it's easy for me to sit here in Toronto and say this, but I would love the Ukrainian working people to have a way to organize and say to the Russians, you know, you want to denazify? Great. Go denazify Russia. 
because you're surrounded with Nazis all around Putin and the, the Russian Orthodox Church and even the Russian Communist Party are virulently nationalist and, and to a large extent anti-Semitic too. And that the Ukrainian workers should take all these guns they have now and point them at the Ukrainian oligarchy. Okay, that's a nice dream. But that said, that class struggle in Ukraine, which up until the Russian invasion was there, boiling, I don't know how strong the workers' movement was, but there were unions. It all came to nothing because of the Russian invasion. Like when you're invaded, that national contradiction with the invader becomes far more primary. And 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 it's, it's, it's very difficult. Like in China, when the Japanese invaded, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party, they were able to mobilize such a force that they could focus on the Japanese invasion and the Kuomintang, uh, the, who were, you know, sometimes fighting the Japanese and more often not fighting the People's Liberation Army and then wound up holding themselves up in Taiwan. But there's no, the conditions don't exist like that in Ukraine right now. But if we want, if the problem is the Ukrainian oligarchy, then it's the Ukrainian people that have to deal with that criminal kleptocracy, yes, with Nazi influence. But the oligarchs in Russia are no better. They're not the ones that are going to clean up and denazify Ukraine. If they had succeeded in invading Kiev, and if they had succeeded in putting in some Ukrainian puppet, then Ukraine would have been ruled by Russian corrupt kleptocracy. So let's not forget Ukraine and Russia are class societies. Now, here's the big problem here in terms of international public opinion and such. The country that's leading the charge to denounce the Russian invasion is a rogue state. You know, the United States is, a, 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 you know, certainly with the invasion of Iraq and many other things, but let's just focus on that, um, is a rogue state. They, they, so what credibility have they got denouncing Russia for being an aggressor, a war of aggression, violating international law? They have zero credibility uh, because of not just what they've done in Iraq, but the kind of pressure and interference and, and other places, uh, backing the Saudis and Yemen and on and on. So that's the complication. But just because the United States is a rogue state and just because they're denouncing this Russian invasion doesn't mean we as progressives don't have to first and foremost have solidarity with the people, that, and not the Russian oligarchy, Ukrainian people who are being invaded. But we must also point out you know, what the Americans really are. I think it's also really important to recognize that so many people have been displaced as well. So when we're talking about referendums, if we're going to have referendums in certain areas of Ukraine, so many people have been forced out of those areas. So you would have to have it in a way that includes them and that maybe has them come back to the country in, you know, under conditions of peace, because it is a bit disingenuous to say, oh, we'll have a referendum now after, you know, thousands of them have left and only a few of them are remaining. That's a bit of a skewed picture of who is there. And, and maybe their opinions have changed in the meantime since, since the invasion. And I think a lot of working class people, just by reading, you know, certain Ukrainian groups who are more working class and have typically been opposed to... Um, the elite have been opposed to Zelensky even, but who are now unified because, you know, they're, they're threatened by the Wagner group or, or by Russian forces who are killing them. Um, so it's kind of ironic how their attention has been now forced against the other kleptocracy and not the one who is also, you know, oppressing them within their own country. And, and hopefully there will be peace soon so that they can actually focus on the corruption and the problems within their own country and, and not just, you know, dealing with an aggressor. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would expect this wouldn't be the first time a referendum has to be organized, even by the UN, where a lot of people have been displaced. Uh, so I think you're right. There has to be a, a process that you know, people can prove they were residents, you know, at such and such time and have a right to vote. And, and if, if 
it was under U UN jurisdiction, Donbass, then people in theory could return to their homes. Um, the, the, the problem here is what's the overriding objective for each of the players here. Um, and if you look at the Americans, the overriding objective, and is always their overriding objective, is global hegemony. They want to be, if you want to be the global hegemon, you got to be the hegemon in every region. So any regional power that's a threat uh, has to be subdued. Uh, I mean, the underlying problem here is the way global monopoly capitalism works, and there's nothing new about it. Capitalism strives, you know, at the, at the individual corporate level for monopoly, at the level of country for mono monopoly within region. Uh, if you're a superpower, monopoly globally, um, whether monopoly corporately, whether your companies uh, can actually control certain sectors of the economy. Most importantly, and this is what exists in most of the world, American finance is the dominant financial player and is the creditor, you know, I don't know, it was Lenin or somebody divided the world in various ways. And one of the main way you can divide the world is creditors and debtors. And up until recently, the United States has been by far uh, the number one creditor country and more so global capitalism depends on american management so wh when the pentagon sits down with the politicians who happen to be in power and the whole foreign policy complex all the think tanks and you know everybody that feeds into this u.s foreign policy and it's a whole class of people really who are driven <laughs> partly by the motivation for profit making for the arms making making countries companies but also an internalized view of the world that america's the beacon on the hill that we're, the america's needed of the world goes to anarchy um you know democracy versus authoritarianism now of course that means democracy i'm doing quotation marks here for especially for people listening on the podcast we've got to keep remembering more than half our audience is listening not watching but anyway um when they talk about democracy they primarily mean freedom of capital to move freely around the world uh so they can go invest where they want they can get countries in debt to them where they want and so on and then a, a, a certain amount of democracy for the people. You get the vote every few years. It's not nothing. It sure ain't what I, any, I don't think a real democracy, especially in the US, where people barely can even vote properly. Um, but even then, uh, in, in all the Western capitalist countries, and I include Canada in that, uh, none of the parties really represent working people. And you know, I won't get into that in detail. But a certain amount of democracy amongst the ruling classes themselves. And when they talk about democracy, I think that's the democracy they're most concerned about. They don't like, and FDR articulated this really clearly in 1938 in the speech on monopoly. The Western capitalists on the whole, and I, there are some that don't agree with what I'm about to say, they don't want one section of capital to seize hold of the state and be holden to a small group of capital. So democracy for the Americans and for most of or all of Western capitalism is democracy where the institutions maintain certain rules of the road. So these institutions play a, a sort of moderating role between sections of capital so that they don't go to war with each other, which they did in the United States. You know, when, during the American Civil War, it was primarily a war of different sections of capital and elite power fighting over how was labor going to be exploited, which section of whether it's North and industrial capital or the Southern agricultural based, slave based capital is going to be the dominant. I mean, they don't want to do that again. They don't want a war. So they've worked out these institutions 
that can moderate between sections of capital without the way feudalists used to, you know, rally peasants to their side. Some peasants would fight for this aristocrat, some for that. And, you know, there was endless wars. That's not good for business, not modern capitalist business. So they want some kind of democracy. They prefer it. They like freedom of capital, but they hate socialism. They hate the idea of public ownership and some kind of democratization where people actually have a say in that public ownership. And when faced with that, they don't mind, especially in other countries, dictatorship. I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia, go on and on uh, since World War II, how many dictatorships the Americans supported. So they, socialism is the greatest enemy to them. Um, and so they're balancing this. How do you have freedom of capital, a kind of democracy, not democracy for the people, but some, at least some that looks that way. And they don't like even a Bolsonaro situation that much in Brazil, where a group around Bolsonaro was starting to really take control of the state. But still, they had elections and the institutions played a role. Anyway, when they look at Ukraine, what's their primary objective? To assert their hegemony over Europe. They don't want Russia to be a big player in Europe because it could be too competitive to American power in Europe. And they hate the idea that there would ever be a Russia-German uh, cooperation alliance. Because imagine if you had a, a kind of Russia-Germany alliance in Europe, who needs the U.S.? There's no longer a, even a role for NATO at all, and it would change everything. So the Americans, that's their primary objective. Well, what should their primary objective be? And what should we be demanding their primary object objective should be? Peace, yeah, of course, but it's more, more, more specific. The, the great threat facing us is the climate crisis and then the threat of nuclear war. And you can reverse it because what's happening, you know, if there's nuclear war next week, no one's going to be around to worry about the climate crisis. So you can't, you, know, you can't even compare these two in a way. They both have to be dealt with. And it's, it's too obvious. It can't be dealt with without an international agreement that includes China and Russia, especially China, but also Russia. So, you know, if, 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 if what good is global hegemony in a world of utter chaos? Like if they thought there was supply chain problems and during the pandemic, just wait till we start crossing the 1.5 and 2 degree warming levels and then three and then four. Now, James Hansen said recently in a study that two degrees warming is already baked into the system. We're, we are there now and we're not at two degrees yet, but it's already baked into the climate. The only way to stop going past two, maybe, maybe mitigate getting to two, is a radical rupture with the use of fossil fuel now, today, and, and a radical moving into sustainable energy today, now. And that should be everyone's priority, including Ukrainians. I mean, what good is a Ukraine that defeats the Russians? One, isn't a wasteland of destruction. How many times have the Americans promised to come into Eastern Europe and rebuild and this and that and do very little? Uh, maybe, you know, there'll be a way to spend money there. But how you think the American people entering a recession are going to be all, oh, let's all go spend more money in Ukraine? But more importantly, what's, what is there of Ukraine or Russia if we don't face up to climate? And if we keep risking nuclear war. So, so the problem here is we've got to step back from why we need to denounce the Russian invasion without mitigation. We need to step back because the problem is the way monopoly capitalism has reached such a moment of utter irrationality that we're on the precipice of destroying human civilization. So once you put it into that context, 
how on earth can the Ukrainians keep talking about liberating Crimea? How can there not be a quick resolution under the auspices of the UN? And yes, the US is very much as the culprit here. Yes, the Russians invaded. Yes, I've said it over and over again. I'm not mitigating that. But the Americans actually do have the ability to say to the Ukrainians, yeah, you have a right to fight as long as you want to fight, including liberating Crimea, if that's what Ukrainians want to do. Okay. But we don't have an obligation to keep arming you if it's threatening the world. And that's what they should say. Not just threatening the world, but also threatening the integrity of their own country. I mean, there, some would argue, even certain liberal historians, I think I've mentioned this before, Stephen Kotkin, you know, he's been a, a, a diehard supporter of arming Ukraine, but he's been saying that what good is the outcome if Ukraine can't join the EU in the end and there's, you know, not much left of their country? It's going to require, like, a huge effort to rebuild the country. We already know that. Like, a, a, something much greater than the Marshall Plan. And it might, I mean, what good will it be if they regain Crimea, but there are no collective security agreements in place, there are no redistribution of wealth in place, there's no, you know, solution for, for climate change in that region, if, even if they have Crimea back, I mean, that's not really a, a great final outcome, at least in, in, in his view. So it would make sense to to focus on what is really realistic. And certain other experts like Trita Parsi have been saying that you can still have diplomacy uh, and not actually have a ceasefire. The, the two aren't the same thing. And, and so many Western countries have been shying away from investing in diplomatic negotiations as if a ceasefire would be around the corner and, and they don't want to downplay their support for Ukraine. But it's it's kind of ridiculous because it's like you can still have these you can still have open lines of communication and, and work toward diplomacy and that won't necessarily automatically lead to a ceasefire. So they should be talking a lot more. But well, one of the most sorry, go ahead. Yeah. But we also don't really know what's going on. I mean, I think, again, this recent Pentagon leak just shows how U.S. intelligence is so much better at gauging what the Russians are doing than what uh, the Ukrainian war plans are. And, and maybe there are some rogue elements in the Ukrainian government. So I feel like countries are kind of just shooting from the hip and they don't have a real strategy in place or else some strategies are just hidden from the West and whether that serves a, a purpose, I don't really know. But yeah, it's really hard to say. But why don't we talk about uh, Russia's role, uh, sorry, China's role in mediating these conflicts. Uh, Macron was recently in China to speak to uh, Xi Jinping to try and put pressure on China to um, condemn Russia's involvement in the war in Ukraine and to potentially, you know, disencourage him fr from sending weapons to Russia. I don't know if China has actually sent any, but that prospect is obviously uh, really disconcerting for people in the West if they think that this is going to become some new form of Cold War or competition between the U.S. and China in the end. Yeah, well, it already is. Um, it, it goes back to this striving for monopoly. Uh, the U.S. does not want to give up its predominant position, uh, and it already kind of is already to a large extent lost it. Uh, I think China is now the major trading partner for almost everywhere, um, and they don't have any foreign military bases. Uh, so they've accomplished this just through finance, loaning money, uh, aid of some kinds uh, because of the size of their market and so on. Uh, but even I think in Latin America, almost if not every major country in Latin America, their major trading partner now is, is, is China or if it's U.S., China's right there next to it. Um, in terms of Ukraine, uh, China is the place that, in theory, uh, should have said no to this. If, if they want to call themselves socialists, then one of the fundamental principles of socialism is international solidarity uh, 
with workers everywhere. And, and a fundamental principle of that is you don't support wars where workers slaughter each other for oligarchs. You know, that's it. You don't. And China's position should have been from the very beginning trying to use the leverage they had to get a negotiated settlement. And, and, and I don't see how the Russian economy would have survived without China buying uh, its oil and gas from Russia. Uh, apparently, they're getting a, a cut rate deal on it. Uh, but that is not the way a socialist country operates, that for the sake of you know, better prices on fossil fuel and for the sake of weakening our geopolitical ally, United States, uh, I'm sorry, not ally, uh, adversary, they like to call themselves, um, you know, it, you know, they, they like, I guess it's in China's narrow interest to see the Americans tied down in Ukraine, you know, spending tons of money there. Um, and maybe they see it mitigates the provocations the United States creates over Taiwan. But that isn't how a socialist country operates. Uh, they, they, they could have and should have used and still should, you know, not be so uh, fuzzy on what they actually think about the U.S. invasion. If you read something called Global Times, which is a website which more or less speaks for the Chinese Communist Party. There's been several paragraphs in there, in some of their articles, where, where they actually do come pretty close to saying this is an unjustified invasion. They don't quite say it all the way, but they come pretty close. But they make a point, and, and in some ways it's somewhat similar to Ellsberg's point, which is you can't humiliate Putin and his government, and you can't try to bring them down without horrible consequences. And you can't hope for the, this, the disintegration of the Russian Federation, which some of the American neocons and even people in the Biden administration, many of them are essentially neocons, hope for. I mean, they're actually seeing this as a, as a strategic opportunity to fundamentally weaken the Russian Federation maybe even lead to its kind of breakup in some ways. And in that way, weaken China. Because they don't like China having this massive resource of fossil fuel and this, and, and, and Russia's not, people have called Russia just a gas station. Well, it's pretty clear that's not. You know, they have a big agricultural sector, they make fertilizer, their arms manufacturing industry is top notch, if maybe even if the army isn't doing very well. Uh, apparently, their sophisticated weapons are at, at world class levels. Uh, so that's not an insignificant ally for China. Uh, and so for the US, weakening, breaking up. So China's issued some warnings in between the lines, saying, you know, you better be careful what you wish for here, America. Uh, you know, a strategic defeat for Putin and the oligarchy and the, and the Russian armed forces uh, can get extremely dangerous for the world. But I would just say back to the Chinese, well, same thing for you. You know, if you don't really try to get this war over with and use your leverage for a UN brokered a deal. And I should mention, by the way, all these arguments about uh, how Donbass was about to be attacked. Well, even if it was, which I, again, I don't see it, but let's say they were. Well, then Russia goes to the UN Security Council and gets a resolution condemning Ukraine for its uh, threat to Donbass, to the autonomous areas, and, get, and try to get a resolution, even, even a resolution supporting an intervention to defend Donbass. They didn't do that. And that's what China should have been saying. If you really think this is such a threat, then use the UN charter, use the UN mechanism. Because you know, China's supposed to be a supporter of that. But you can't make speeches about defending uh, sovereignty and, and, and integrity and, and then be quiet about Russia, Russia's invasion, which is what China's doing. So there's this mix going on here. Of, uh, you know, people, you know, they want to call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. Well, fine. If, but, but, you know, without getting too deeply into, you know, at this time, although I'm happy to do it some other time, you know, is this actually a socialism or not? 
Um, well, maybe it is sort of, but not not the kind certainly that Marx and Engels ever imagined, in 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 the sense that where's the democracy for the workers? But okay, let's set aside that right now. If you say you're socialist, then you need to abide by the principles, and the uh, you know principle. And in fact, the Soviet Union was very involved in some of the uh, international law that was written that condemned wars without imminent threat, condemned them as wars of aggression. And China has supported all that, has supported that concept. And, and, and yeah, I get the problem here and what I said earlier. The biggest criminal and the biggest purveyor of wars of aggression since World War II is the United States. And of course, the biggest criminal prior to World War II was the British Empire. So Anglo-American imperialism has more blood on its hands, pro you know, even than Hitler. I mean, the British actually killed more people over the 300 years of the British Empire. I mean, anyway, it doesn't, you don't need to compare who's the worst criminal. I get why peoples of the South see the United States as the greater danger. I get why, you know, in much of the world, people see the U.S. as the greater danger. And in an overall way, I guess it is. Because it, it is the power of the United States, the power of American finance, the corporate power. It is, they are the primary obstacles, even on the climate front, in spite of all their rhetoric, of, you know, pretending they care about climate. But it, these are not dogmatic, easy, simple rules that the Americans are to blame for everything. You know, if you were uh, in Pakistan and India attacked or vice versa, or the fight over Kashmir erupted, uh, you know, again, uh, you wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be clear you know, where the U.S. was, where Russia, China was. Maybe China's a little more towards Pakistan. U.S. certainly backs Modi, but India's keeping up its relations with Russia. It's, it's a complicated jigsaw puzzle there. That being said, if you're in Pakistan, you're worried about the Indians. And, you're, and if you're in India, you're worried about the Pakistanis. And then the world better worry about nuclear war between India and Pakistan, because that's enough to create a nuclear winner that could kill a billion people. And this is the thing, it doesn't matter kind of what, which conflict you look at. The big picture comes back to the issue of climate and risk of nuclear war. So the, uh, the fundamental thing we need to be saying to all these powers, including the Chinese, and I, I'm, you want to call your, you know, yourself socialism with Chinese characteristics, fine. Although I've never heard of a socialism that didn't have some national characteristics. I mean, Cuba's had Cuban characteristics and so on and so on. Whatever. The fundamental principle of a socialist country is international solidarity amongst working people. So you mean, you do what you can to end this war and, and there's probably no force in the world right now that has more possibilities for ending this Ukrainian-Russian war uh, than China. At the you know, they're still not doing it. Having said that, though, I think there is an argument to be made for the fact that the U.S. is the greatest obstacle to this so-called rules-based international order, and with quotation marks. I mean, they they use this, at least in my view, they use this as a, a discursive tool to pursue their own interests. So they keep saying that, you know, we need to condemn the war in Ukraine, we need to condemn Russia because we need to safeguard this rules-based international order. But the problem is, is that if they actually cared about these customary norms and these international standards, then they would be the first to uh, prosecute Bush and Cheney and to hold their own war crimes to account. But they've insulated themselves and ensured that the ICC w w would never have any jurisdiction over them or issue uh, an arrest warrant for any American officials. And I'm sure that's why the majority of the world is just looking at the West and saying, you know, all your talk of democracy trumps autocracy is is bs because you don't hold yourself to those same standards but i would ask you 
does that then mean because they're so hypocritical that they shouldn't hold uh, potential Russian war criminals to the same standards? Like, how should we go about um, ensuring that there's some form of international justice? And maybe there there would be, you know, Ukrainian war criminals as well that would need to be prosecuted. I don't know. There there have been, you know, UN reports or I think like an amnesty report maybe that showed that there were war crimes on both sides, but you know, the, the reports show yeah. that there were probably were more systematic war crimes on per- perpetrated by Russian troops than Ukrainian. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, there, there is such hypocrisy in the American position um, that I think, and, and the Western position, uh, who, who, and, and I, I must I'll include China for there too. I mean, did the Chinese demand accountability for Bush Cheney after the Iraq War, I, I don't remember where of any I've looked. I can't see anything. I don't. I don't remember the Chinese coming to the United Nations and asking for war crime trials for Bush Cheney. They're far more interested in developing U.S.-China trade. Um, of course, that's what should have happened. I, I mean, it's a joke. Uh, you know, the hypocrisy is so terrible that even prosecuting Trump looks hypocritical. Because such bigger crimes were committed by former U.S. presidents, and there, you know, you, including Obama, because and I'm, and I'm not even talking about the drone program here. But if I understand it correctly, under international law, uh, o- President Obama had an obligation to prosecute Bush Cheney for war crimes, and by not doing that, he becomes a collaborator, and and that. My, you know, at the time when Obama was president, and this was like a much hotter issue, I interviewed, you know, several experts in international law, and it wasn't just the need to prosecute Bush Cheney; it's that Obama himself could be prosecuted. But given that the only people that seem to ever get prosecuted are from small countries, who, who, and I, I, you know, it's not like I shed a tear that these guys get prosecuted. But when the big war criminals don't, and especially when the American war criminals don't, then let's get real about how do we get to a peace and how do we get to dealing with climate and the risk of nuclear war. And any attempt to prosecute Putin or other uh, Russians for war crimes. And yeah, I mean, they're never going to go after Ukrainians anyway. Uh, you know, if, and of course, if you're going to do it, you might as well go after all war crimes. But it, it's a pointless exercise. All it's going to do is make it impossible come, to come to an agreement. And if Putin thinks his life's on the line, and not just him, the people around him, uh, they're going to fight to the death here. So let's get real about what should be done. Yeah, if you want to prosecute Putin, great. Let's start with Bush Cheney and all the other kinds of people. In fact, Larry Wilkerson, who we interview all the time, you know, he said, you know, if there is a prosecution of Bush Cheney, he should be in the dock too. And in fact, Ellsberg has said, if he was, it's going to be in the film, there's a clip where Ellsberg says, because of his role as a nuclear war planner and in Vietnam, he, if, if he was charged with war crimes, he wouldn't plead not guilty. But the, this idea that the Russian war criminals, sure they are, should be held accountable by Western war criminals makes no point. Because the fundamental problem here is we need to stop the killing of ordinary people. The slaughter of ordinary people has to stop. And this, you know, this accountability you know, of the Russians, it's a propaganda game because you know, the truth is uh, I would doubt the Americans even want, really want Putin held accountable because that sets a precedent. Of course. You know, if you have a war of aggression and you're going to do now what was done to the Nazis in the Nuremberg trials, well, maybe, yeah, maybe there should be some Americans in Nuremberg style trials. And of course there should be. Anyway, it, it's a distraction at this point. Well, I have one final question, and that would be, how do you see things playing out in Russia? How do you think the Russian people are going to react if they're, you know, several years of war? It's obviously hard to see into the future, but the current sh- sanction regimes have not had a really horrible, deleterious, short-term effect on the Russian economy because, of, you know, Russia and the central bank, they've known how to, or they've learned how to isolate themselves themselves. 
from the effect of these sanctions and they have China as a huge trading partner. So and I think India. the short term effect hasn't been that measurable. But what do you think will happen long term if if they don't repeal sanctions and if this war continues? Do you think we'll see hunger strikes or any sort of anti-war movement? Um, I don't know the answer. I know there's two possibilities, maybe more, but there's one that the Chinese describe in, like I said, in the Global Times articles I've seen. And that is, if it looks like the Putin government is going to be humiliated, if it looks like they may really fall, um, if it looks like the Russian Federation starts to even come apart, um, then this becomes a much a much bigger deal than it already is. Meaning that the Russian people, now I'm quoting the Chinese article, start to see this not as a quote-unquote special military operation that doesn't touch most of their lives that much. They start seeing it as a great patriotic war. And there's a Amongst much of the Russian population, certainly not all, but much, as it is in the United States, there is a toxic mix of religion and nationalism that forms much of people's identity. And if people feel that identity so threatened, you know, their, their whole existence, like in the United States, we're number one, we're number one. Democracy, democracy, and all, how many working people go off to die in Iraq, Afghanistan, or other wars, really, truly believing they are fighting to defend the identity of their people, the freedom of their people? Well, the same thing's going on in Russia. And, and, and many, many people truly believe God, a God who, the Russian God, you know, it's like it's like back in the Viking days. You know, the Vikings had their gods, and the British had their gods, and they go to war to see which gods are going to win. Uh, well, much of the Russian people's identity is based on on this, and and you know, as we saw with the German people in the lead up to World War II, this being humiliated, as as the Germans felt after the Versailles Treaty. And, and, and the deliberate humiliation of the Germany after the end of World War I. Um, and they probably would have done the same thing after World War II if it hadn't been for there was a Soviet Union. You know, the Marshall Plan and, the, and wanting to help Germany get back on its capitalist feet uh, certainly had economic considerations to promoting, you know, a, a American capital in Europe. But if there hadn't been a Soviet Union they would have stuck it to the Germans a lot worse than they did after World War II. Um, anyway, so one scenario is that the Americans keep the pressure on, keep trying to actually bring down Putin, keep hoping for the worst for Russia and by implication China. Or one Yes, an anti-war movement develops in Russia. Uh, Boris Kargolinsky thinks, you know, I've interviewed him a few times, he thinks the Russian military are against what's going on, or much of the leadership is. They, he thinks maybe they'll intervene at some point. I, I don't know whether he's right or wrong. Or mer maybe the American oligarchy and American capital capitalists, they get, this is getting to the point of risking their own assets. Even, you know, I've been saying uh, my joke about the, my film on nuclear weapons is, you know, Wall Street has, you know, say they have a responsibility to defend the assets of their investors. Well, don't you have the responsibility to defend the asses of your investors? Uh, you know, maybe they get that th this ain't the best thing for money making. And maybe the Russian oligarchs get this isn't the best way for us to be rich. Maybe. Uh, you know, World War One and World War Two they did eventually end. Um, uh, but there was a craziness on the German side, a kind of metaphysical ideology that went with German nationalism. Um, one hopes 
in Russia, maybe they can be more pragmatic about it. But the Americans have to create an opening for that to happen. And maybe the Chinese can facilitate it. I mean, otherwise we're into shit. I mean, let's be straight about it. Uh, we're into, I don't know how long the war goes on. And as long as the war goes on, um, I don't expect unless, you know, there's a great reverse change in policy. I don't think the Russian state as such is going to be threatened by the way it is now if it just keeps going. So I don't think Putin, you know, is deliberately going to use a tactical nuclear weapon unless he's really on the edge of humiliating defeat in Ukraine. And that's not out of the question. Um, so is the U.S. going to push it to that point? Um, then the second problem is the longer this goes on, the longer miscal the more opportunities there are for miscalculation. So that missile that landed in Poland, at least the Americans quickly said it's not Russian. And it turned out it wasn't Russian. Um, so the Americans aren't looking for an excuse for a nuclear war here because they could have quickly blamed the Russians for that missile. But what happens if a Ukrainian missile of some kind or more than one, some shit hits the fan and it's heading towards Moscow and they don't actually know what it is. They have very, this is the problem. It's one of the main points of the film with inter, inter, intercontinental ballistic missiles. There's very little time to decide what is it on your radar screen? And it's very, you know, we've had miscalculation after miscalculation. We've come very close to nuclear war. So the tenser this gets, the longer it goes, the more chance for miscalculation there is. So maybe, maybe some rationality, at least on the nuclear issue, enters some of these ruling classes' heads. I mean, the Chinese are concerned about this. You can see it like I say, in global times, I mean, you know, even if the Chinese have nothing to do with it, if some kind of nuclear weapons are used, it leads to the end of the world. I mean, if it, if it becomes full out nuclear war, there's no China left after that. So they, they certainly do get the risk of all this. Um, so one hopes that there'll be some rationality. I, I, I'm not seeing that there's a, a movement now or yet the, the repression in Russia is very strong and, and it's... Yeah, you can you know, be arrested for 15 years or something. It's kind of weird, I'm being told. Like some people like Kargalitsky speak out quite openly to foreign press, not domestically. And they don't do anything about it. And then other people are going to jail for five or 10 years for saying, you know, it's not a, it's a war, not a special military operation. Um, but the repression's there, no doubt. And... So even if anti-war sentiment is rising, it's not breaking out in a way that's going to change things. And then, so then the other problem is, you know, if the world really goes into a deep recession, and who knows whether that's happening or not. Anyway, we're, we're on a knife's edge. And the solution is simple. The Americans have to bloody well stop uh, provoking and pushing this. Of course, the Russians need to, to negotiate and, and stop making unre completely unreasonable demands. Same thing goes for the Ukrainians. And one hopes the Chinese, whatever you want to call them, uh, they find it in their interest to really try to facilitate this thing ends. Well, Paula, was great getting your insights on these really tricky issues. We haven't seen you in a while, so it's great to hear what you had to say about all of these things and about the war. So thank you. And thank, thank you, you for watching theanalysis.news. Please do go to our website, theanalysis.news, and hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen. Please do get onto our mailing list as well, so you'll be notified every time a new episode comes out. And also go to our YouTube channel, The Analysis hyphen news, and hit the subscribe button and hit the bell. That way you're always informed once a new episode drops. Thank you.